Well, good morning. Good morning. Well, it's good to be with you all this morning. Um, this past week, I traveled to North Carolina, which is where I was appointed for four years before coming to serve with you here at First Broad Street. And so when I had the invitation and the opportunity to go and be with my students at the college ministry I was a pastor for, I was so excited. They had a senior banquet Thursday night, and so I surprised a lot of them by showing up. And it was such a joy to be with these students that I'd spent three of their four years at Carolina with and to see them grow so much. You know how different you are when you come in at 18 <laughs> versus when you go out at 22. I mean, there are some of them that I think I never, I never would have pictured that they would have made it this far in life already, right? Like they just, I wasn't sure if they would be able to get to that point. And yet here they were, and they were making me proud, getting ready to graduate. So I want to show you a picture of the group. Um, I, I photobombed their picture, even though I wasn't supposed to be there. <laughs> this is the picture of all the group um, from UNC Wesley Campus Ministry. It was really, really wonderful. And to be back in North Carolina was such an emotional experience. I had not been back uh, since September, and in September I didn't really visit with my students or with my clergy friends. And so it was pretty emotional, an unexpected emotional uh, experience for me. I tried to explain to some of my friends because I was crying, and I didn't want them to think that I was unhappy where I am, right? Because I'm very happy here. But I was trying to explain to them that, you know, this is home for me. First Broad Street, Kingsport is home for me. It feels wonderful to be here, but so is that place, and it feels good to be with them too. And so it's wonderful, you know, people go through life and they don't ever feel at home anywhere, but I have two places where I feel like I have a community of faith um, and I'm at home. I got to drive by Duke Chapel while I was there and to think about all the amazing friendships that I had. It was a beautiful, beautiful day. And every day on my trek up to, um, to Divinity School, this was my view. And I kept thinking, they're going to realize that they let the wrong person in. Because I'm really not smart enough to be here um, among all these really amazing people. Um, but it was a humbling experience every single day to get to go into that place and to be there with so many awesome people. So I was exhausted. I arrived home Friday evening, emotionally, physically exhausted. In fact, that exhaustion carried over to yesterday. So I'm celebrating my mom's birthday this evening. Her birthday is Wednesday, but she asked me to make banana pudding for her. And so I put the banana pudding together. I put it in the fridge and closed the door. And then a few minutes later, I realized that the bananas were still sitting on the counter. <laughs> and so I'm still trying to figure out how I'm going to work that out today. Um, so that she doesn't just have to have birthday pudding, but she can have birthday banana pudding. Um, so to say that this has been a crazy week um, of highs and lows is definitely um, an, an is over-exaggeration, you know, right? Well, this morning we conclude our series called After the Cross. And over the past several weeks, we've talked about the encounters that Jesus had after his resurrection with his followers. And so we have this morning, um, we're talking about Thomas, but the first week we talked about the Emmaus Road experience. And so Jesus came alongside of two of his followers and he walked with them. They didn't know who he was. Their eyes were not open to him. But it wasn't until they sat down for dinner, they offered him hospitality, and he took the bread and he broke it. And when he did that, their eyes were open to him. They remembered the rabbi, the one that had taken bread just four days before and broken it with them at the Last Supper. And then last week, we talked about Mary Magdalene, a devout follower of Jesus, the one who is in every single resurrection story as the first person to see Jesus resurrected. We talked about Mary's uh, own experience with Jesus, where she she did not recognize him at first, and it was wasn't until he called her by name that she recognized him. And so we talked about last week that how Jesus really wants to be revealed to each of us, that that's really important for Jesus to be revealed to us in our relationships, and that Jesus also wants us to loosen our grip on the things that are holding us back, and he wants to send us out. He says, go, go and tell the good news of my resurrection. And so today we hear of another encounter um, it's a strange encounter because Thomas is probably the, the last of the disciples to encounter Jesus. And so here are these words from John 20. Thomas, the one called Didymus, one of the twelve, wasn't with the disciples when Jesus came. The other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But he replied, unless I see the nail marks in his hands, 
put my finger in the wounds left by the nails and put my hand into his side, I won't believe. After eight days, his disciples were again in a house and Thomas was with them. Even though the doors were locked, Jesus entered and stood among them. He said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, look at my hands, put your hand into my side, no more disbelief, believe. Thomas responded to Jesus, my Lord and my God, and Jesus replied to him, do you believe because you have seen me? Happy are those who don't see and yet believe. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. God, I pray that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on all of us gathered here, that you would speak through me and in spite of me a word for all of our hearts about your, um, your grace that's offered to us in so many amazing ways each and every day. Amen. Well, the most beautiful thing I ever saw in my entire life was something I didn't even know existed. I was a missionary for a summer in the Caribbean, and I was positioned on the island of Eleuthera. We decided we were going to hop over to another island, and that meant me at 5'2", climbing into a plane that I had to crunch down to get into. That was how small it was. We hopped over. It was about a 15-minute flight over to the other island we were at, which was Cat Island. And we were there for the week. We spent the days with children in the community, uh, leading a vacation Bible school and doing some repairs on the manse, which is what they call their parsonages there. And so... Each evening, and I, I say to this day that I've never seen stars as beautiful as when I've been in the Caribbean because there's just no light that is def deflecting the lights of the stars. And so each night we would sit there, we would look out over the vast uh, sea and see God's creation with all the stars. And there was one night that I saw something and I could not believe my eyes. It was a rainbow at night. It was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen, these really deep, rich tones. You can see it right here. And until that moment, I never knew it existed. And if you had told me that it did, I would have said, Ugh, I'll believe it when I see it, right? Because how beautiful is that? How amazing is that? And so once that night ended and I got back to the United States, I started doing a little research and realized that it's something that is a phenomenon that's called a moon bow or a lunar bow. And it's because the light from the moon is reflected and it has to be pretty perfect conditions for this thing to actually happen. So after my trip to Eleuthera, I would tell people that I had seen this rainbow at night and they thought I was a lunatic. Like, Rainbows come out after the rain, right? That doesn't happen in the evening. People would rarely believe me when I told them of this experience that I'd had. And so I'm thankful that, thanks to the Internet, I could get a picture of that for you to show you today so that you believe me whenever I say it. So have you ever said, I'll see it when I believe it? Have you ever said that? Or you have to see it to believe it? I've said that a time or two. How many times have we heard these phrases in life or spoken them to other people? People may say, I may say, okay, I know the meeting's at 11, and I'm going to show up on time. And the rest of the staff would say, I'll see it. I'll believe it when I see it. She's always like two minutes late. I'm always two minutes late. It's after this experience, I stopped wearing my watch. In the Bahamas, after I was a missionary, I stopped wearing my watch. So that's part of the problem. What if we, what if what we see isn't all that we get? You know, you see... What you see is what you get is another phrase that we use. But what if what we see isn't all that we get as people of faith? We walk by faith, not by sight, right, as people who follow Jesus. We didn't have an encounter with the risen Lord like the disciples and like Thomas did. And yet we live our lives following this resurrected Jesus and the examples and teachings of him. Somebody we've only read about, heard about from other people. You know, sometimes it takes an encounter with Jesus to deal with doubt that we might have about our faith. And that's what we read about in this story about Thomas. Ever since I was little, when people would preach or teach on this text, it was always doubting Thomas. And nobody wanted to be a doubting Thomas, right? The real, the faithful believers of Jesus never had any doubt. And doubt was considered to be negative, right? This was clear. Disciples. Followers of Jesus, they were faithful. They did not have doubt. And as true as that was for first century believers, it's supposed to be true for me today. I am not supposed to doubt. 
I don't recall anyone ever talking about what happened if I did doubt, but yet there it was. Many scholars say that when Thomas said he wanted to see the nail holes and Jesus' pierced side, he was simply saying that he wanted to have the same experience as his peers. Every other follower of Jesus, all the other disciples had experienced this, and yet he had not. Practically everyone in John 20 gets to see the resurrected Jesus. We know that Mary Magdalene does. We talked about that last, last week. We know that the disciples on the road to Emmaus did. We talked about that two weeks ago. So why, why are we so hard on Thomas? He just wanted to have the same experience that everybody else did, right? Mickey Rainwater shared that with me this week that during his time in seminary, he heard a professor say, Doubt is not the opposite of faith. Apathy is the opposite of faith. Because doubt and faith are both active. You can be actively pursuing Jesus and have doubts. You can do that. That is a thing that happens. In a book called A Prayer for Owen Meany, John Irving, he recounts this experience he had with a friend of his who was not a believer. He was an atheist. And in one scene in this book in a schoolyard, they were looking out over this big gray granite statue of Mary Magdalene. And as the sun began to set and it became dark, John said to Owen, so that statue's still there, right? Even though we can't see it. I mean, it's pretty dark out here. I can barely see you. You're just a few feet away from me. And he said, of course, of course it's there. I have no doubt that she's there. He said, oh, you have no doubt at all, but we can't see her. He said, well, sure, you can't see her, but she's there. We just saw her before. I'm not wrong. She's there. I know that she is there. And so John said, so you absolutely, positively certain that she is there, even though you don't see her. And he said, yes, she is there, even though I can't see her. And he said, well, you know, now you understand how I feel about God. I don't see God, and yet I know with everything inside of me that God is there. And so Owen is this example of the kind of faith that the gospel writer John celebrates here in chapter 20 because Owen believes so fully in this statue. Um, he believes fully in this, that he's willing to stake his life on that conviction. And that's what we see here is that we don't have to see the signs and wonders, and yet we believe as people of faith. So if we go back to Thomas, get back to Thomas, and I think about what the issue is here. So if we don't focus on Thomas's doubt, what might the story be for us? What is the point of this teaching? Well, what if the issue here isn't that Thomas was doubting? But what if the issue is that Thomas had an issue with his community? Okay, so when Jesus shows up, Thomas isn't doubting Jesus' presence there. He doubted the words of the people who were telling him that they had encountered Jesus, which is different. It's not disbelief in Jesus. It's disbelief in those people that were his brothers that said they encountered Jesus. In fact, his response to Jesus before he ever put his hand in the nail-scarred hands or on the side of Jesus was, My Lord and my God, he believed without even touching these scars. Thomas doubted his fellow believers. He couldn't just take their word for it. He had to see it to believe it. There's a professor at Phillips Theological Seminary in Tulsa, Oklahoma, who says, you know, in rejecting the other disciples' good news about what they had seen, Thomas rejects the very friends that he had spent his entire ministry with, the ones that he'd shared life with for so long. In fact, in John's gospel and letters, love and trust within a faithful community are the most significant expressions of the work of Christ in their midst. And so Thomas's words, they carry a sting for this community because there's no way I'll believe unless I see it for myself. I can't trust you, is what he's saying. I can't trust your word that you have encountered the risen Christ. He could be saying, you know, your eyes and your fingers are not enough for me. I need to be able to touch Jesus for myself. And so this community that Jesus has tried so hard to build is coming into question with this disbelief from Thomas and his skepticism. Perhaps the most concerning thing about this passage isn't doubt, 
but a lack of trust that Thomas has in the people that are his brothers in Jesus. So can you relate to that at all? I think in the church a lot of times we do have some untrust towards people around us. All too often we find it hard to trust others. We believe the worst before we believe the best out of someone's intentions. In the place where we should be able to be most vulnerable, most open and trusting, you know, a lot of times we're closed off. We don't share about what we're really dealing with because we don't trust people to love us where we are with what we're encountering in life. I may never tell you that I doubt Jesus because I'm afraid of what you would say. Rather than helping draw me along in my faith journey, often we assume the worst. So we may say that we don't doubt the decisions of our brothers and sisters, right? We don't doubt those decisions until they're not the decisions that we would make, right? And then we doubt those decisions that are made in our church and in our community. We don't question others' faith in Jesus at all until they make a decision or do something that is different than how our faith in Jesus is lived out, right? This kind of radical suspicion for our, commu- our companions in faith, it still tears at the fabric of our churches today. It's everywhere in every single church. We can list occurrences of things that happen where we distrust other people almost every day in the church. Maybe even experience, perhaps, perhaps even in these walls. Maybe it is when someone will not accept the trustworthiness of those who lead the congregation as either laity or staff. Maybe there's seeds of doubt that are spoken against leaders and sown into community. And that is not the way of Jesus, right? If you cannot prove it to me with evidence, then I can verify on my own. I refuse to accept the truth that you are trying to tell me. Skeptics say dismissively of those who speak a different kind of truth. If you can't prove it to me, then I'm not going to believe it. But that's not the foundation for our faith, right? Right? We believe something that we've never really seen. We believe it because people told us about it, and we read about it in Scripture. So what if this story isn't about Thomas doubting Jesus? What if this story is about Thomas doubting his community, his brothers and sisters in Christ? What if the story of our faith isn't just about trusting in Jesus, but what if it's also about trusting in the, in the believers of Jesus and in this community, trusting one another? There's a lack of trust and an air of suspicion. It's common in our churches today, and at some point, if our churches are to be faithful to the risen Christ, then we must stop distrusting one another, right? Even when we disagree, we can still trust that God is at work. We must stop questioning people's motives. That's probably the thing that gets me the most, is that I just automatic, people automatically assume that I have the worst intentions if I don't agree with them. That's not the case. That's not the case. Doubting dedication and thinking the worst of one another when we state a different opinion or lead differently is not the way of Jesus. So we must learn to believe not simply in the goodness of the Lord, but in the goodness of one another. Even when someone delivers the strangest news, like, I've seen the Lord. That's what Thomas encountered. And then we hear Jesus say, blessed are those who have not seen and yet come to believe. So our community here and out there is looking to us for good news. They're looking for us to be proclaimers of the gospel. And we do so confidently, knowing that this good news can carry us and can carry them through this life, no matter what it brings. So as the band comes forward and prepares us for the end of worship, I want us to think about those things that we are suspicious of around ourselves. Maybe it's somebody who differs from you politically, theologically, Instead of discounting the people who are different from you, what would happen if we opened ourselves up to hear and to be in conversation with one another, to really trust each other in community? What if those people who are in leadership in our church, 
you didn't automatically assume that they were self-serving and the things, choices they made were all about themselves. But what if you trusted that what they were doing, the decisions they were making, were led by the Holy Spirit? What could that mean for you? It's a hard thing to trust. For me, I am one that my husband will tell you, oftentimes he'll tell me he's done something and I don't believe it till I see it, right? I have to go make sure that it's the right way or it's how I planned it to be. And this is the man I'm married to. I'm supposed to trust him above anybody else on this planet. And it's so hard sometimes. Think about that. As brothers and sisters in Christ, how can we not doubt Jesus, but doubt one another and how that can affect our relationship with one another and with Jesus? We want you to live fully into who God has called you to be. And so my prayer is that we'll be freed from that suspicious nature that we have. We can open ourselves up and live into who God has called us to be. Let's pray. God, just like doubting Thomas, we admit that sometimes we doubt. We may not doubt you or your will or your word, but sometimes we doubt those around us who are trying to live into your will, who are trying to be obedient to your word. And so, God, I pray that you would break down those barriers, those walls that separate us. Help us to be vulnerable with one another, to be open to one another so that we can grow closer to you and closer to each other. And so I pray, God, that any time we hear about Thomas's doubt, we realize that when it came to his encounter with you, he didn't doubt. He believed. Help us to be believers. I pray for us to have encounters with your risen Son, Jesus Christ, to see Christ and experience Christ through our neighbors, through one another. Thank you that you do not discourage doubt, but you embrace it. But you call us through that doubt and that untrust so that we can be faithful followers of Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen.